first milestone. So we're going to prove what I called theorem B in the first lecture. So it was uh, the following criterion. To check if the Boolean variety has rank zero. So here's the theorem. I've already said this once, I said the first lecture, but I'll call it now. So suppose that you have an Abelian variety for Q. And you have two distinct prime numbers. And N is odd. And suppose you have the following conditions. So first of that, A has good reduction away from N. Second, uh, at n, we require that a has completely torus reduction. And the special five group in our model is a torus with a connected component to this. And the third condition is one on the torsion of a as a Galois representation. So we'll deal with it. bar points, that's a representation of the Galois group. And the condition is that the irreducible constituents of this representation are all just the trivial representation of the same function. Let me, before we go into details, let me tell you the idea of the proof. So recall the proof of the weak Hornell phase theorem. So we showed that you get an injection from AQ mod NAQ into the first Galois homology group of the torch. So the Coomer sequence of A gives you some injection like this. Injection. And so like I said when I was proving this, it suffices to prove that this group is finite here. Finite is here, but this group is not finite because we haven't restricted our ramifications. The full Galois group did. So in fact you can show The image is contained in some restricted ramification group, each one GQS, AN. And this group is finite. And that's the proof of weak mortality. Okay, and the point is that as you restrict your ramification, the set, as you let it be smaller and smaller, this H1 gets smaller and smaller in size. And so what we're going to do is try to take S to be as small as possible, to restrict uh, the size as much as possible and get the best bound on this quotient. So in general, you can take the set S. So in the general case, you can take S to be the set of primes where uh, A has bad reduction. So primes with bad reduction, together with the primes dividing this N we're looking at. So in our case, we're going to take this n that we're looking at to be a power of p. We're going to look at p to the n portion. And so in our case, we can take s just to be the set of p and n. So 
these H1 classes that we're going to get, be getting are going to be unramified away from just two primes. But that's not small. You need to go, you need to do better than this. And you can't actually do better than, better than this if you're thinking about Gal homology because you will get ramification. But the kind of ramification that you're getting is constrained in a way. You need to understand that. And so here's how to make that precise. So let script A be the narrow model of A over the full ring of integers over C. And let, uh, I'll call GN the P to the N version in the narrow model. So this is a group scheme over C. So it, this Galois cohomology, H1 GQS, so this S, on the p to the n version uh, can be described in a, a way in terms of the tau homology. This is actually just the tau homology over the scheme spec z of p and n inverted of this group scheme g. So uh, when you're over a field, you know the tau site of a field is just the kind of extensions of that field. And, the Galois cohomology corresponds to the tau cohomology over a field. And then when you impose ramification, the way that works is you're just dealing with the tau cohomology over the ring of integers with whatever primes inverted where you want to allow ramification. So the way that we're going to kind of do better in dealing with just these two primes, there is ramification, so we can't do the tau cohomology over all spec z. And that thing will probably vanish, and you don't get an injection of this into that. The tau homology. But you can use the FPTF homology. So that's what we're going to do. So there is an injection of A of Q by P to the N, A of Q, into the H1 FPTF over the full step Z. Oh, oh um, I mean, this is the generic fiber of that GN. Yeah, that's one. And that's a finite flat group scheme over the space when you invert it. So there is an injection of this thing, this is A of Q, and A of Q, into this H1. And so this is kind of how we're constraining what's going on at PNN and this FTPF group. So actually, there's a slight light here, and I'll correct this at the end, but this is basically the picture. You have to deal with the connected component of the neuron model instead of the full neuron model. And so what the, the, sort of the plan is that we're going to show that this group here, we're going to understand this very well, and we're going to show that it's bounded. The cardinality of this group is bounded independent of n. So that means that this thing here, this cardinality is bounded independent of n, and so that means that you have to have ring zero. If you had a z inside of this a of q, you'd get a z minus p to the n, and the cardinality would go up with n. So the main point is the bounded cardinality here. And to do that, we're going to have to understand very well what kinds of group schemes comes up and what other uh, FPTF homology looks like. So that's what we're going to be talking about most. Any questions? Yeah. This? Yes. Okay, so. So here, so we're going to start for real now. So some definitions. So, so P and N are going to be fixed for the whole lecture. So a group scheme G over Z join 1 over N, I'm going to introduce a term, is pre-admissible. If it's finite flat and killed by a power of p, commutative killed by a power of p. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we've been thinking about a lot. And a group scheme over z is admissible, a pre-admissible rather. Other conditions. So we want it to be still commutative and killed by a power of p. 
commuted is flat killed by a power of p. But we don't want it to be finite over the OC. We want quasi finite. We want it to be quasi finite. Uh, and finite over when n is inverted. And then just some other chemical conditions separated in front of presentation. Okay, so the basic example to keep in mind is if A is an abelian variety and it has good reduction away from N. Then the P to the N torsion of the narrow model is greatness. That's good reduction away from the neural model is actually an abelian scheme over ZH on 1 over N. And so the PGVN torsion there is some nice finite flat thing. And then at N, you're not going to get finiteness because you don't have properness of the neural model there, but it's still going to be quasi finite. So everything that's going to show up is going to be pre admissible, so you can just kind of, it doesn't really matter so much what the conditions are. The important thing is admissibility, which I'll now define. So suppose that G over, suppose we have some pre admissible group. So let this be pre admissible. Uh, and admissible filtration is an ascending filtration of zero. Subgroups. Such that the successive quotients, F i and F i minus one, are either z mod p z or mu. And we say that G is admissible if it has such a filtration. And then there's a similar definition for Galois modules. So a uh, finite Galois module, I'm going to write gamma q for the Galois group to use a group scheme. Start with a pre-admissible group over the join one over n. So let this be pre-admissible. Then G is admissible if and only if this Galois representation is admissible. So 
therefore it's determined by its Galois module, which is either trivial or cyclotomic. So H is either equal to mu p or d mod pz over the space. Now the point is that all three of these guys extend to finite flat commutative group schemes over z to n over n. So. so basically, I mean, if you localize the situation at p, then you can think of these three things as being groups over QP, and they, you know, H is one of these two things over QP, and they all extend to finite flat things over Z. And so that's the situation where Renaud tells you that the isomorphism extends. So I only stated Renaud in the local case, but in this application of this time. This application of it is fine, except there's one detail that is not fine. Does anyone know what it is? What hypothesis do you need to apply to this here? Okay, so starting from the first step of the filtration of the Galois module, we've built the first step of the filtration of the group scheme. And so now you're done by induction. Right? Just look at G mod H, do the same argument there, and you can build a whole Okay, so this is good because it tells us that, I mean, free admissible is kind of the condition that we get for free. We always have that. And this is saying that to get this stronger condition of admissible, we just need to look at the Galois module. And that was sort of the hypothesis that we put in that theorem. Our original theorem exactly says that the Galois representation we have is admissible. So that's how we can get admissibility for our groups. Do you have a question? Yes. What was that case there? So now we're going to define some invariants to admissible groups. So let G over Z be admissible. I'm going to define a few numbers. So L of G is just the log base P of the order of the generic fiber. So the order of the generic fiber is some power of P, so log base P is just and this is called the length of G. <clears throat> it's the length of uh, admissible filtration. Delta of G is going to be the difference between this number, its length, and what you would call the length over Fn. So if G were actually finite and flat over Z, then these two numbers would coincide and this delta would be zero. So this delta is somehow measuring the failure of G to be finite over all of Z. Alpha of G is just the number of Z mod PZ in filtration. Transitive. If a 
simply going into that tree. And what I mean by simply transitive, more precisely, is the following. So IE, for any section of T over some scheme over S, the map that you get from G to T by acting on that section is an isomorphism or bijection of sets. So G can permute the sections of T around in it, does so simply transitively whenever you do have a section. And so I, an FPPF torso is a torso that has a section of an FPPF cover. The torso for which there exists an FPPF cover. The FPPF cohomology group is just a set of isomorphism classes of torsors. You could also define a tau force with T1, which trivializes over the tau cover, and then the tau cohomology is the set of the tau forces. And of course, um, H0 at PPF is just the sections. So we need to use 0 as the first at PPF homology, but you can make it done more concretely in terms of this description. So over all of C, there are, are two additional. I mean, each one of these extends in two ways to all of these. So there's four. So to be more precise about it, let me recall this proposition. So this is something that we stated when we talked about quasi-finite group schemes. We talked about how you can extend them. Uh, let me just remind you. So suppose H is a finite group scheme over Qn. Then we showed that the extensions of H to a pre admissible group over Zn corresponded to the unramified submodules of H. Unramified Galois submodules. So in particular, if this Galois representation with two endpoints, I mean, HQ is one dimensional and unramified, then there are exactly two extensions, right? You can take the submodule to be zero, or you can take the submodule to be the whole thing. And one of them is finite. 
That's the one where you take the whole submodule. And one of them is called the extension by zero. That's where you take zero to be the submodule. Okay, so this reasoning, I mean, together with some simple kind of patching, lets you classify the uh, indisciple groups over Z. So there are four. So you have its extension from zero from z adjoining one over n. So this thing has stock z mod pz everywhere except at n, where it has stock zero. You have mu p, you have mu p's extension by zero from z adjoining one over n. So every admissible group over z has a filtration so that the quotients are one of these four things. So And so now we're going to compute those invariants I defined explicitly for each one of these four things. So here are the answers. <coughs> so I'm going to draw a table for the answers. PZ, PZ flat, UP, and UP flat. And so we had delta, alpha, H0. Okay, so the deltas are 0, 1, 0, 1. The alphas are 1, 1, 0, 0. Space. H zeros are 1, 0. And then uh, from UP, it's 1 if P is 2 and 0 otherwise. And from UP flat, 0. And then for H1, it's 0, 0. And then again, 1 of P is 2, 0 otherwise here. And then down here, it's a little more complicated. I'll write epsilon. And epsilon is given as follows. So epsilon equals 1 if P is odd and P divides n minus 1. Or if P is 2 and n is 1 mod 4. And that's like the zero otherwise. Does this make sense to everyone? Are there any questions? We're going to do the proof. Do you have questions about the statement? The number of Z mod PZs in the filtration. So this line is the easiest one, right? It's the number of Z mod PZs in the filtration over Z to n one over n. So this guy still counts as having Z mod PZs. The alpha line is very easy. The delta line is also easy, right? It's just the difference between the size away from n and the size at n. So these ones we've extended to a finite thing. The size is the same everywhere. And here you just remove the fiber at n. So you get one away from n and zero. So the delta line is also pretty obvious. But each zero line is also easy. So Z mod PZ is a constant group scheme over Z, so it's global section Z, Z mod PZ. Right. One there. This guy is missing something, right? So you, I mean, there's no map, there's no section of that because you can't hit the missing point. So you get zero. For the same reason, this is zero because it's missing point. And then UP, well, it's global sections. In that's the P through of unity in Z. There's one when P is two, and you get minus one. And otherwise, you don't get everything. The only line that's actually interesting is the final line, the H one. So let's compute that. So we're gonna have to use some things about FPPF metallic homology that I. Can't really 
explain completely. So, so okay, we'll begin with the uh, new mod people. So, the first thing I want to say is that it's STPS homology is the same as the top homology. So I'm going to let uh, SP step Z. And the reason for this is because Z mod P Z is an Italian uh, group scheme over S. So um, if P is an FTPF torsor, Z mod P Z, then by definition there exists an FTPF cover such that P has a section over S prime. And whenever the torsor has a section, it's isomorphic to the group. Such that the base change is Z mod PZ. In particular, that means this base change is a path, which is Z mod PZ. And so when you base change along this FTPF thing, you get a tau thing, and that means the original thing was a tau because FTPF is a tau local property. And the tau torsor has a tau section, so you can just use the torsor itself. Okay, so th this is why every FTPF torsor is an account torsor and why you get this uh, equivalence quality. And then since this is a constant sheaf, it's at first a tau homology, it's just Hans from the fundamental group. It's just like a topology, right? You're doing H1 with Z coefficients, that's Hans from the pi 1. So this is Hans from the tau pi 1 of S into Z mod P. What is this pi 1? Does anybody know? What is O? What is the Italian pi 1 of spec Q? Pi one of the field is the absolute gallop of the field. Yeah. So when, if I do like pi one of z join some prime, invert some primes, then I'm allowing ramification at those primes. Yeah. The maximal the gallop with the maximal extension are ramified outside those primes. So here I have spec z, I've thrown away no primes. So this is the gallop group of the maximal extension of q, which is everywhere on ramified. And there are no extensions of q which are everywhere on ramified. So this pi one is true. This is because all extensions of q are ramified. So this thing is here. All right, so that, that computes this number here. So this is the second place, I think, so far, where we've used the word over Q. We already used it because we needed to use Renault's theorem. And now we're using the fact that pi 1 is trivial. So now we'll do the extension by zero of z mod p z. All right, so there's a short exact sequence of sheaves. The extension by zero injects into z mod p z, and then there's some quotient g. And this g is just supported at n. So this is actually the push forward. Z mod P Z by the map spec F N into spec Z. And so we can look at the sequencing cohomology that we get from this. So we know that the H0 here vanishes. So we get, first thing we get is H0 of Z mod P Z. And 
going to get h0 of this g guy. And that maps to h1 of this thing. And then that maps to h1 of this, which we already showed as a. So this group here, we already computed. It's the sections of Zima PZ. That's kind of obviously Zima PZ. And this thing is also Zima PZ, because I mean, we're just pushing forward from Fn and then pushing forward to a point of Zima PZ. So this is just like the sections of Zima PZ over Fn, which is again Zima PZ. And so this map here, this is injected with an isomorphism, and so this group. some duality theorem about how each one of the dual relates to each one of the original thing. There might be a way to do that, I don't know, but there's an easier way. Yes. Whenever you want to figure out each one of something like mu p is the Kummer sequence. It's the go-to. So you have this Kummer sequence is an exact sequence of sheaves on the FPTF side of Z. <coughs> And the reason, I mean, what it means to be exact in the FTPF side, right? I mean, a surjection of sheaves, it doesn't have to be surjective on all sections, right? It just means that if you have a section here, then you can find a cover that fits that element. So to say that this is a surjection of FTPF sheaves means that if you have some unit somewhere, you can find a flat extension of that ring and the p-foot and that flat extension. And the way you get the flat extension is just by joining the p-foot, and that gives you the p-foot. And this isn't just a surjection of a tau sheet because the joining of p through p to p is not usually a tau thing. So, I mean, if, you, if p were invertible in the base, then it would be a surjection of a tau sheet, and you could take the tau cohomology, but you have to use the TTF cohomology if you want to recover all of these. Okay, but once you know that you have an exact sequence like this, you can just take FTPF cohomology and get a long exact sequence. So, the h0 of gm, oh, I guess I'll write it Okay. Uh, H0 of mu p, uh, I guess I'll write the whole thing. Okay. Everything is going to be, okay, I'm just going to write H whatever for <laughs> PTF cohomology. So here we can put the p torsion in the H1 and GM. And this map here is multiplication by p. So what's H0 GM? Plus or minus one, the units in Z. This is Z star, and this is Z star, which is plus or minus one. And this is multiplying by P on that group, meaning raising to the P power. So P is odd, that's a bijection. Minus one to the odd is minus one. And if P is even, that's the zero map. All right, here's a harder question. What's H1 of GM? All right, so H1 FTPF of GM is the same thing as the Zariski H1. So this comes from flat descent. So granted that, what's the What's, what's the Zariski H1 of G? Why? Yeah. So a, the Zariski H1 of GM is always pick. That's kind of almost by definition. And pick of a ring of integers is the class group of the number field. And 
class group of Q as well. So here's the third spot where we use the root over Q. Before we needed that pi one was trivial, just strong. This is no unknown factor. Before we needed no unknown factor. So this is weaker than before. That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay, maybe that's all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so this thing always goes away, and this thing goes away if p is odd, and if p is even, this map is zero, so you get an injection of my two here. So this shows that uh, h1 of this new p is one if p is two and zero if p is not. by zero of one P. So we're going to do that one kind of how we did the extension by zero of E mod P. We're going to start with this exact sequence. Or again, this G is just to push forward. similar sort of thing. So we know that the H0 of this new P extended by 0 is over 0. So I'm going to start with this guy. So we'll consider the P even and P odd cases separately. So P is odd. So in that case, we just showed that this H1 of new P is 0. So then we have to worry about what's going on here. And we know that H0 of new P is also 0. So that means this map here is an isomorphism. Awesome so this H1 here is just the H0 of G. And this is just the sections of new P over Fn. And so that is z mod pz if p divides n minus 1 and 0. Other words. So both of these things, so this H1 and UP we already computed. We did this by Kummer theory, and this was Z star mod Z star squared, which is Z mod G. And this thing's also Z mod 2Z. So now you actually have to think about what this map is. 
So there's a, we just have to understand the non-trivial element here and what it goes to. So the non-trivial element here is supposed to be some torsor from U2 defined over Z. And if you think about Kummer theory works, I mean, how it actually works is the, the unit, I mean, this thing was like units mod P power units. And the way that you get your torsor is by looking at the P roots of that unit, right? That's a torsor from UP, because then two P roots will differ by P through unity. So this, the torsor that this thing corresponds to is, I mean, you're joining the square root of negative one. So, I mean, this S inside of here sits back at N. And so if we have this U2 torsor, we can just pull it back to here, and we get a U2 torsor here, and that's what this map is. So this map, I mean, this torsor here goes to zero, if and only if the pullback here goes to zero. Because the trivial torsor. Trivial torsor is one that has a point. So the non-trivial non -trivial class in H1 UP goes to zero if and only if staff of Fn adjoined root negative one has an Fn point. And so this is just asking if minus one is a square. And that's if and only if n is one last one. <clears throat> All right, so the non-trivial class goes to zero, meaning you get a kernel if and only if n is one last one. So this shows that this h1 is one if n is one last four and zero. Are there any questions? So we're using that computation just to prove this proposition. Uh, suppose that we have an initial group. Then h1 minus h0 is less than or equal to delta minus alpha. And here's the proof. So suppose we have a short exact sequence of invisible loops. Then we get a long exact sequence in FTPF cohomology. we have this long exact sequence, we can express the order of this h1 minus that h0 in terms of some things. And so you, you get that uh, h1 of g2 minus h0 of g2 is equal to h1 of g1 minus h0 of g1 plus the order of this thing, so log base p of the order of k minus h0 of g1. Sorry, it's a g3 on And this log p thing of the order of k 
is obviously less than H1 of G3, because K is inside H1. This is less than or equal to everything the same, except here it's like H1 of G3. So in other words, this shows that H1 minus H0 is sub-additive in short of that sequences. Just by definition, though, alpha and delta are additive. Right, because alpha is counting the number of things in the filtration. So if you have an extension, the number of things in the filtration, then it's just the number here plus the number there. And delta is just the order of some fiber in that side of the short effect sequence. So we're trying to prove that some sub-additive thing is less than some additive thing. And so, I mean, if we're in a situation like this, the proposition is true for G1 and G3, then it's true for G2. The weird thing is H1 minus H0, so I don't know how to think about that so well. It's not like the full oil characteristic. Alright, so now, now we can prove the theorem. satisfying blah blah blah, we're trying to show that's run zero. I'm going to let A be the narrow model over Z. And I'm going to let A with the zero up top be the connecting component of the identity. So this has come up once before. What I mean by this is you, you take the, the connecting component of the identity in each fiber. It's like the union of those. So in other words, you throw out the non-identity components in each fiber. So there's only one fiber that actually matters, right? Since A has good reduction away from N, it's actually an abelian scheme, except over N. And then at N, you have some actual neuron model that's not abelian, and so there might be some components. And I'm just deleting those finite linear components at N. Okay? And then I'm going to let uh, GN be the piece of the N portion here. By assumption, A has good reduction away from N. And that means that these GMs are what I call pre admissible. Okay, that was some very general thing that you usually get for free. But also by assumption, this AP2 bar is an invisible Galois module.
And that implies that APN is one also. Right, because the P to the N torsion has a filtration right, powers of P where the greater pieces are just a P torsion. And so this implies by what we proved that GN is actually admissible. No, that's not important because the admissibility condition is only when you invert it in, right? So the generic fiber of this GM is the TDM version. So that, that hasn't come in yet. All right, so now we're going to try to figure out, I mean, we want to sort of control the H1 of this GM. And we're going to do that by using the theorem we proved which means we need to figure out alpha and delta. So we're going to try to figure out alpha and delta of GN. Okay, so first of all, the length of GN, this is just something that's dependent on the generic fiber, and this is just 2 GN, where G is the dimension of that. Right, it's just kind of the, the size of the P to the N torsion in it. So it, this fiber of GN over Fn bar is the P to the N torsion in here. And this guy, the connecting component of the identity over F and bar, is a dimension G torus by hypothesis. It looks like GM to the G over FT bar. So this is just mu P to the N to the G. And here we're using the assumption this is since we have torus reduction. <coughs> So the order of Gn over Fn is just Ng. So this delta of Gn is this thing minus this thing by definition, so it's just Gn. So now we'll do alpha. So uh, alpha is additive, and this gn is an extension of g1s. So it's an iterative extension of g1s. So that means that alpha of gn is just n times alpha of g1. I think you know what that is. And so, well, I'm going to ignore the p equals two case. So when p is not two, uh, alpha of uh, g1 is just the number of Zeeman pieces in alpha over fn, which is equal to, uh, sorry, alpha over f t, the p torsion in a zero. Right there, I mean. By definition, alpha is the number of z mod pz. When I say n, I mean as constituents, right? So by definition, it's the number of constituents over z. And all I'm using here is that, you know, if you look mod p, then z mod pz and up are different things. So you can just count mod p's that are over z. And that's why you need to assume p is not two here. But there's some way around that that I don't remember at the moment. Okay, so it's the number of z mod pz's in this. So in other words, it's equal to the sort of log base p of the order of the maximal tau quotient of this. Uh oh, sorry, that should be g1 of that. I should have said this in two steps. Alpha of G1 is the number of Z mod PZs in G1. 
which is the same as the number of EMFUVs in G1 over FP. And G1 over FP is just that thing I wrote on the right section just there. And you don't need to be connecting components because that only shows up in characteristic N. This is just the size of the tau quotient of the P torsion in A over FP. Now the point is that this A over FP only has ZPs and UVs. Wait, I mean, now, th this thing's the same as G1 over FP. You know, that's true for G1. So this thing only has those two things. So that means it's ordinary. It doesn't have anything that looks additive. So we, we proved in the ordinary case that the P torsion has the same number of ZPs and UVs, it's always G. This says that alpha of G1 is G, and so alpha of Gn is G times N. This is actually pretty cool. I mean, the reason that we know this for the mod p, that it only has these things in it, is because, I mean, we started with this assumption in the Galois presentation, and then we used Renault's theory. So we're starting from some assumption that p torsion over q bar, we're concluding that mod p is guy's ordinary. Ordinary is just the condition mod p, the initial condition is of a gq module. And ordinary is equivalent to the p torsion only having zp and up. Right. You know, local properties. All right, so alpha is g times n, and delta is g times n. So the difference is zero. Delta minus alpha equals zero. So that implies that H1 of Gn minus H0 of Gn is less than equal to zero. But now we know something about H0 of Gn, actually. So the actual group, this is the set of P to the n torsion in here. Right? That's just kind of by definition. And I mean this A0 of Z sits inside of A of Z. And the neuron, I mean, the neuron mapping property, one of the defining properties of the neuron model is that A of Z is equal to normal A of Q. So what do we know about this group on the right? P to the n torsion and A of Q. What happens as n gets large? Yes, right? The mordell Bay theorem says that A of Q is a finally generated group. So it only has so much P torsion. Zero here is bounded as n grows. That's the same true of H1. So now we're going to, now we understand something about the H1 of our end torsion. Remember the way that this worked is that we were going to try to inject our Q points mod P to the N into the H1 of this torsion. 
And the way that we do that is by using the, the Kummer sequence. So we have to use that. So the Kummer sequence is this sequence. So there, there's a subtlety here, actually. So we, we want to say that this, I mean, we want to actually say that this is an exact sequence. So we need to know that this map, I mean, it's obvious this is the kernel, but why, why is this map a surjection? So the, the basic reason, so I mean, we know that this map is flat. So it's enough to know that it's surjected, you know, if it's an FPPF map, then it's going to be a surjection of FPPF sheets. And the, the reason that this is surjected is that each fiber is p-divisible. So A0 is p-divisible. I mean, the fibers are either abelian varieties or torque. They're p-divisible. So multiplication by p-divisible is surjected. That's not true if you used A instead. Why is that? That's right, at N, A, the full A is an extension of a torus by some finite group. That finite group has some P part to it, and multiplication by P to the N is not going to be surjective. I overlooked this when I was first reading the paper. I don't think Nader says anything about this, and I thought you could just use A. So like an hour before class, I realized that that's actually not true. So you have to use A0 if you want to use this kind of argument. And it's also not true since we're working over Z that this multiplication by P to the N map is a tau. So this, is, this map does not be a surjection of a tau sheet. So you're sort of forced to use that PPF cohomology in this situation, because it's only exact in that site. You have to use A0 instead of that. Right? So anyway, this is an exact sequence. We can take it to FPPF homology. Uh, and so we get that H0 FPPF of tech Z on A0 tends to the Z mod P to the MZ injects into H1 FPPF tech Z. So, I mean, this thing is just the z points of this tensor to the z. This says that if I look at the z points here in tensor with z mod p to the n z, the cardinality of this guy is down.
right, so that's the whole proof. Are there any questions?